My name is Daniel Gruß. And my name is Eric Kraft. Uh, we're from Graz University of Technology and the talk um, was originally submitted also by Martin Schwarze who cannot be here because of a, another appointment and uh, I thought because I mean uh, you are still a student, Martin is still a student and I'm a professor, I thought I should wear a jacket now so that I look a bit more professional. Um, the last time I spoke at Black Hat, actually I was a Black Hat keynote speaker, not, not this year uh, but at Black Hat Asia, I think it was in 2020. Um, so. Um, I, I think uh, that's already um, a nice thing to be here also in person because that was virtual. So I'm really uh, happy to be here. So today we are going to talk about... I don't see the slides yet. Yeah, but it shows a video stream of us. I have to recon Did we check the laptop. Oh. Let's check the laptop. Something is not there on the laptop, but this can happen. That's better, almost, almost perfect, right? Yeah, nice. Okay, so uh, we are going to talk about remote memory deduplication attacks and me remote memory deduplication attacks. Um, memory deduplication has been a topic for a long time already and and I know what this bug is. <laughs> yeah, I had this. Um, let me just... Yes, now it's back. Now it should stay. Okay, um, so remote memory deduplication attacks, um, they have been, uh, um, yeah, that's actually the remote part is the new part. Memory deduplication attacks have been around for a long time. Um, and uh, in this talk, we will focus on the remote scenario. Why do we do that? Because more and more services are hosted in the cloud or on remote systems that we use all the time. And they store our secrets. Yes, exactly. So what the providers try to do is they try to isolate the secrets using virtualization or similar techniques, but still they share the underlying hardware to improve utilization. So, and because of that, because of the shared hardware, there are yeah, multiple side channels that you can exploit, both in hard and software. So for example, in hardware, you could have a cache attack like prime and probe, or in software, like we present today, memory deduplication attacks. And another thing is that the network throughput is increasing and increasing, and the latencies get more stable, so that makes a remote attack more um, easier to achieve. Yeah, that's actually a big problem now, because previously we had these attacks maybe on the same machine where you had the attacker and the victim on the same machine, but in different containers or virtual machines. Yes, or, or, we, saw, yeah. or we saw attacks uh, running in a browser tab in JavaScript. Exactly, yeah, or um, what we look at now on the network. So we want to attack a system where we don't run a single line of code. The other system is not under our control. We just send network requests there, and we still want to leak all the secrets. Do you think that's possible? Oh, it, sounds, it sounds really strange, it sounds and nobody unreal. tried it yet. So. Yeah. yeah, but probably it worked. We got a CVE. So let's continue. Um, memory deduplication. Um, why, do we, why do we want to talk about this? Um, memory deduplication was disabled after the first wave of memory deduplication attacks. Linux disabled it, Windows disabled it, and then later on they realized, oh, but we could re-enable it if we add some security around it. And uh, today it is also used still in virtual machines. We have also talked with um, providers there. And the current mitigation there, what is the current mitigation? The current mitigation just prevents it uh, between security domains, but not inside a security domain. So they don't consider a local attacker in their in the threat, a uh, remote, remote attacker in their threat model. Exactly. So the deduplication still works within the same uh, security domain, right? Because you say, oh, they, the pages belong to the same security domain, shouldn't hurt to deduplicate them. But can we maybe exploit that across the internet? And that's the big question of this talk. But before, yes. let's take a step back and, and talk about how memory deduplication works. So we see here a setup. We see on the left side there is the attacker process, the virtual address space of the attacker process. On the right side, there's the virtual address space of the victim process. And below, you see the shared physical address space. And you see some pages that are color coded, and the colors stand for the contents of the pages. So pages with the same color have the same content. And what can now happen is 
you see, you see, of course, every virtual page is mapped to a physical page, and that's um, yeah, illustrated with this dashed line. And what now can happen is that the attacker creates a page with the same content, like here now. He has also created a page with the blue content, let's say. And then on a, on a uh, operating system with memory deduplication, from time to time, a, a kernel thread will start scanning the physical address space. So for example, he compares the first page to the other pages. And as long as they don't match, nothing will happen. And he will just continue scanning. But if he comes to a page where the content matches, he will merge these two pages by um, modifying the mapping. So they point to one of them and set them to copy and write. So they are, this page is then read only. And has the and has the same physical uh, physical address like shown here. Yeah, and this also gives us a perfect oracle to tell whether the victim has a page with exactly that content somewhere in memory. So what can we do there? We can now you said a copy on write semantics that yes. we have there. We can exploit those. We can time how long it takes to write to this page. Exactly. And then we learn well, the operating system has to copy this back. And then we learn, oh, this was a slow write access. This page was deduplicated. So what we do here is we measure all the time this delta between end and start for the write access. And this tells us whether the page was copy on write or not. But maybe we should have a look at the timings here. How, how far are they really apart? Yes. So let's first look at the local timings, because we don't want to start with the network yet. So what we see here locally, you see the blue, the blue um, pages are not copy and write uh, marked, and the red ones are copy and write access. And you see it's easily distinguishable locally. So there is a microsecond between those two, a gap where there's really nothing in between. So that's very easy to do. So you really see this, this small bar down there? That's the, the non-copy and write cases. Yeah, the small blue, blue. Yeah, so this oh, is yeah. very, very easy to distinguish. I think I can give that to a, to a first semester student. Yeah, everybody can, can do yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. So um, how does our attack then work across the network? Because we, we can't create pa pages in the victim domain, can we? Yeah, you can if the victim domain runs a server, a server application that allows you to do such things. Mm -hmm. So in our setup, we have the attacker now separated by a network from the victim. So he has no chance to execute any code locally. He can just use the APIs that, uh, that are offered to the outside. And what you see in the top, this is the, the physical memory of the victim. And there is a two pages. And let's say the attacker wants to know if page A is in memory. For example, he wants to fingerprint the library and then takes a and this is a unique page of this library, and he wants to use, exploit that to know if this library is in the memory. So what the attacker then needs to do and what the victim needs to offer is, firstly, the attacker has to be able to send the, the data, the page, to the victim, and the victim has to store it page aligned in, in the memory and also keep it there. The second, second thing is that the, then, after some time, the data application will run, and the two pages are merged and yeah. marked copy and write. Yeah, so in this case, then A and B would be deduplicated within the same security domain, right? Yes, exactly. So why is that a security problem now? Yeah, it's, if, if the attacker is also able to basically overwrite the same page, then he will see a, a timing difference. You mean in place? In place, yeah. With an update operation? Exactly. Ah, but there might be an update operation. Yeah, that's sure. Many web APIs offer such things. So that's really bad. So that means that the victim will now write to page B again, will update it, and this triggers copy on write. And this can be measured by the attacker. Yes. Yeah, but sure, you have the network noise, but you just do it more often, and then it becomes Yeah, yeah, but, but this will not work over the internet. Over <laughs> a realistic setup over the internet, this cannot work. No, this is like the difference in nanos. We had a nanosecond yeah, scale there. Yeah. Cannot work. Yeah, we will see. <laughs> so did you try that out? Yes, we tried it out, yeah. Oh, and? Don't you remember? <laughs> yeah, so, yes, we tried it out on a, on a remote server over 14 hops over the internet. Um, yeah, so we have a very high latency there, um, and we detect a KVM setup uh, on a Ubuntu or a Ubuntu virtual machine and KVM, 
Um, and there we had a service running just off the shelf, Engine, Nginx uh, with PHP, with Memcached and with MySQL installed. Um, and then we also used uh, PyShark to capture the web requests. Exactly. Yeah. But still, 14 hops across the internet, this will have latency variation in the range of milliseconds. How can that possibly work? Yeah, and that's one of the problems. So you would need many, many requests to, to be able to distinguish it with this, this setup. So one thing you need to do is you have to amplify this. You have to make multiple cow uh, accesses during one remote request to see the difference more easily so that it, the time becomes less and it's more realistic setup. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we use amplification across the internet. And like I said, you basically just increase the amount of pages you overwrite that are marked with copy and write. For fingerprinting libraries, this is easy to do. You just take multiple unique pages from the library, store it in the, in the server, and then overwrite them at once with one request. So, and um, for a cover channel, you can also just you can just amplify that by storing more, and you can also transmit multiple bytes in parallel by just storing more. And we did the, we did the requests with AsyncIO because <clears throat> it's faster than doing sequential requests, and then we reached a cover channel which um, has around 35 bytes per hour. Well, actually, 34 bytes per hour. How fast is that in comparison to other channels? It's so, not very fast, right? Uh, if you look at remote channels, it's, it's not bad. OK, so we'll take a look at uh, remote channels then. Um, so here we have uh, some of the covert channels that we had so far with page deed application. And if we take a look there, then you see that some of them were already remote. But usually that meant that they were running in a remote controlled environment, like a browser or a cross VM or, again, the browser. Mm -hmm. um, and that means there was still code running locally on that machine. So that's different in our attack, where we don't run a single line of attacker controlled code on that machine. So we have no local execution of whatever type. Um, and we still are able to leak uh, quite a lot of data over an hour. Yeah, so maybe, um, yeah, maybe let's also mention here, we can mount different attacks. Um, here it says bytewise leakage, case, and break, and mm -hmm. fingerprinting. Uh, maybe we can go through th these attacks also, but before we do that, we should pinpoint what are the challenges to mount these attacks. The challenge, the first challenge is to amplify the latency, as uh, Eric just explained. Um, and the second challenge we also mentioned already, we need to trigger and observe those copy on write page faults while not sharing any memory with the attacker domain. Yes. Exactly. And the last, <clears throat> the last challenge that is not really necessary for fingerprinting or a cover channel, for example, is to find remote paths that not only allow you to store this data in a page length way, so, but also to change the alignment of the, of the data you want to leak. And this gives you then more powerful attacks like bytewise leakage of data from, from a database. So can we take a look at the first challenge maybe? Do you have any data for that, how well that works? Yes, we collected um, a plot which shows basically if you increase the number of deduplicated pages, the time increases linearly with that. So that's very nice. So you can just increase the number of, of, data, of pages that are deduplicated, and then you get a, a nice amplification out of there. And this scales linearly. So you can yeah. basically scale it to any number of microseconds or even milliseconds yes. that you need yes. for your measurement. OK, so that sounds bad. Uh, but there are two more challenges. Maybe we figure out we can't solve them, and mm. then we're good, yeah. right? So um, let's, let's uh, try the second challenge. So how do you trigger those copy on write page faults without shared memory? So there are multiple possibilities. Some websites offer a file upload, and files are uh, buffered in the page cache, which is part of the physical memory. Mm -hmm. And if there is also an overwrite operation offered, then you can already use this as a, as a possible uh, solution. And we tried this with, uh, for instance, with memcache. Yes. Uh, data will be cached in RAM, so it's not written back to the disk. Um, and the attacker can update or overwrite the uploaded data, and with that trigger those page faults. Well, again, the question, how well does that work? Exactly. If you combine that with the amplification, we have another plot for that. Um, and here you can see uh, how the accuracy goes up with the number of requests that you make. 
and also for different amplification factors. Yes, and there is some very sweet spot, so you don't want to send too much requests, and you don't want to have too much um, amplification because it also makes you have to send more data. But there is a spot where you have a sensible amplifications like 8 or 16, and a still low number of requests then with a high accuracy. Mm -hmm. But here, you, you see it still says local network. I haven't, still haven't seen a network, uh, uh, internet-based attack here. So maybe this will follow later. Um, let's also talk about the fingerprinting case. Um, we can fingerprint a system now by uploading memory. So if we do that, for instance, upload a, a page that also appears in some specific binary version, then of course our oracle tells us whether the server is running that specific binary version. Maybe that could also be useful information. And there again we use memcached to store and replace the data, and then we can uh, fingerprint yeah. that. Yeah, there's one more challenge with, with memcached. So it stores the, the, the items are stored in blocks of one megabyte, and you don't really know which alignment the items you, the attacker stores has in there. But you can pre-compute it and then basically just store uh, the, uh, these, um, the attacker control data with all possible alignments, and then you, you have always one that gets deduplicated. Yeah, um, so um, also a, a problem here might be this uh, free list. Yes, yeah. so you cannot really directly overwrite data, mm -hmm. but you have to, if you overwrite it, send another request, and it comes on a free list, and then you have to send another request that then finally overwrites it. Yeah. So basically somebody could interfere with this. So it's sort of a race condition. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But it's doable. So let's take a look at how well this works. The fingerprinting over local, I, g I guess it's over local area network again. Yeah, first, of course. <laughs> okay. So here you can see it. Um, and you see that a timing histogram here for the non-copy-on-write case, so where the attacker didn't guess correctly, um, and the number of requests that you, that you have on the y-axis. And here, the copy-on-write case. Yes. So this is the case where the attacker found a page that exists like this on the system. So we can clearly distinguish those two cases based on the histograms. But what about the internet? Yeah, let's take a look at it. So as before, we have the non-copy and write case. Uh, you first. need more requests here. Yeah, that's the first thing you, you, you see. You already need more requests. Mm. And also the timing is larger, of course. But then let's look also at the cow case. And yeah, I mean, still you can distinguish it. it Not so nice, but still yeah, possible. It's, it okay. has more noise, but it's still possible, yeah. yeah. Okay, but that's only fingerprinting. That's not a real good attack yet. Can you do something like breaking KSLR remotely without running a single line of code on that system? <laughs> yes. Okay, then let's do that. So we want to break KSLR in remote VMs. And um, what is the idea there? So the idea is you search pages in the, in the kernel text that are static except some pointer to the kernel text itself. And then you basically only have to try all 512 different possibilities the kernel text can get from the, from the ASLR. And, yeah. So that's a page that contains basically all predictable data and just these yeah, 512 just this different... Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you have only to guess the pointer, different pointer possi possibilities and yeah, then you have it. But I can parallel that. Uh, run that in parallel. Exactly. Like you parallel can just it. upload your 512 guesses, then overwrite them and see who, which one has the largest time. You may have to repeat this a few times because of the noises we saw, but then you have to... to okay, so this attack will be very slow. It will take ages then, I guess. So the attacker uploads uh, some data, triggers the page faults, and that's it. So, so how well does it work? It works very well, I would say. But let's, see, let's look at, uh, at the picture. Mm -hmm. So I guess everybody can see which is the right kernel offset here. It's not too complicated. Yeah, so the one at the, on the left where the timing is high, yeah. where we clearly got a copy on right uh, fault. Um, yeah, and overall this, time, uh, this, uh, this attack also is very, very fast. Yeah. Only a few uh, seconds, minutes. Minutes, minutes. low four minutes, so it's yeah. really nice. So this is really nice. Um, but then we have a third challenge, and this one is tricky to really leak data byte by byte. And there we focused on a setup with InnoDB, um, mm -hmm. a database management system, um, for instance, used in MySQL, MariaDB. Um, so what do we exploit there in InnoDB? So InnoDB has an 
optimization, it's called reorganization. It is used if the free space is too fragmented into an index page that a new record would fit in there. And then it basically rebuilds this page by inserting all, all records again in their logical order and then inserting the updated record. And an attacker can exploit this optimization to basically control the alignment of a secret record. And yeah, uh, for the InnoDB attack, we still used memcache as leakage, privilege, uh, as leakage um, method because we didn't, with InnoDB, it did not work because of some inner, inner problems in InnoDB with the storing. Yeah, but it's still fine. Yeah, it's right? still fine. I mean, you can data. use anything for leaking that you want. As a, yeah. yeah. So, InnoDB. Maybe we go a bit more into the technical, the technical uh, details there, uh, so that we talk a bit about the InnoDB records that we exploit there. Mm -hmm. So what do they look like? So they have some header, some footer. What is yeah. the interesting part of this InnoDB record? So the thing is, InnoDB stores record in these index pages, which are 16, kilobi 16 kilobytes large. And as you said, there are some headers and footer, but we don't care about that. In between, there are the actual records. Mm -hmm. And what we see here, we have one record RD, that's the the record the attacker wants to leak. And before, we have two attacker control records. So the attacker has to before insert these two records, but it does not really matter if there's a gap between them and the secret record. Mm -hmm. They just have to be before there. And what, also, what you also see at the end is the trailing free space. So always when you update a record or want to insert a new record, then in the B tries to insert it into this free space except it is, it is smaller than before. Then it does it in place. But in any, every other case, it tries to insert it there. OK, so that means you can somehow place the victim data right next to your data, or even in between. Yes. And that's also what the attack does then. So we place this data in between. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. By, I mean, by updating the records, the attacker can, can uh, get this reorganization running, and then it what happens is that it reorganizes the page, and then you have your alignment record before the target somewhere. And by changing the, the size of this alignment record, you can move, move, around, move it around and change its alignment. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we, maybe we go a step further. I mean, in, at the end, then we have this reset state, and then we can repeat the attack yeah, okay, no, exactly. um, after that. But let's go one step further and uh, think about the, the bigger picture of how this attack on these uh, InnoDB records then works. So. Um, in this setup, we have an InnoDB page that we want to leak, where we have uh, a set of known data. And at the end, you see this illustrated with the S. That's the first byte of the secret. And now what we do with memcached, we send a lot of requests to memcached and create the 256 possible um, solutions for this riddle. 256 possible characters that could be the secret. Exactly. So and the flow of the deck is then first use this reorganization trick to shift the secret byte into the into the InnoDB page. So you have only the known data and this secret byte. And you store the guesses like Daniel said in main cache, the 256. And then you basically just wait for the application. So the operating system will then run the, the kernel thread, and after some point, it will be done. And what you then see is that exactly the byte with the correct secret guess will be deduplicated, while the others are not deduplicated. Yeah, exactly. But then doing that a single time is not enough, right? No, it's not enough. So we and also, we want to leak more than just one byte. Yes. So what do we do? I mean, now we learned the secret byte. Yeah, exactly. So we have more known data. Exactly. And what you then can do is just, again, do this, do this um, reorganization to shift the next byte in. And then you continue and continue until you have your whole secret leaked. And that means you can read all the memory contents there byte by byte yes. without running a single line of attacker-controlled code on that system. It just uses the offered APIs. That's, that's pretty bad, yeah. We should do something against that. But maybe let's further talk about the attack before we talk about possible mitigations. Yeah, so one thing we did not have yet seen is we didn't have an amplification, though. We just had this one index page. And it's, like I said before, you would need many, many, many requests to then can distinguish it. And that's not very interesting, because the attack gets very, very slow. Mm -hmm. So we also use another trick to still have this, this amplification. And so what it looks like 
if you change the alignment, you, the, the bytes you use for the alignment, you can change. For example, here it's A. And in memcached, like before, like it was before, you would have then this A alignment byte and all the attacker guesses. Yeah, and they would then be the duplicating the yeah. right uh, prediction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we, like we showed before, that mm -hmm. it's basically the same case. But how do you amplify it then? If I create further pages with the same content, they will all be deduplicated with the same page. Yes. Huh. And there's one trick you can use. So you basically change this alignment byte. Okay. And that's waiting for the ah, duplication. Yeah, we, we saw this already before, so mm. let's skip that. But you can, for example, change the amplification byte. Now we have a B here. And in memcache, you basically store as many different alignment bytes as you want to have amplification. Ah, so, so that means now when you start the attack, now the correct page from the first row would still be deduplicated. Yes. But you change the inner DB page now, so yes. this gets a copy on write fault, but you're not interested in that one, in the timing yeah, of Yeah, I mean, I don't care about what is an inner DB. I, but yeah. now you have a second page with the Bs, yep. and you can create further memcache D pages. Exactly. And there, again, the one with the right secret guess will be deduplicated, and that's how you then again get some deduplication, ah, amplification, as before. Very nice. And then you do this with an amplification factor of, I don't know, here in this yeah, example, 26. 26. And you would sum up over all the columns, 256 columns, and for one of them, you would now have an, a highly amplified peak. Yeah. Ah, very nice. Okay, so this is a yeah, very nice attack here. Um, so yeah, so we we um, will store this information then, and then we have recovered uh, that byte, and then the overall attack works like in the overview. Um, but how do we how do we stop that? Because now this looks a bit uh, dangerous. How do we stop these attacks? Yeah, there are multiple possibilities. So the first, the easiest one is obviously let's just say let's disable memory deduplication. Mm -hmm. But that's maybe not uh, a good answer because memory deduplication can save a lot of memory. It can even save uh, power consumption in some cases. Um, so I don't think we will see this disabled. No, that would be, like you said, a waste of resources. Yes. So what else can we do? Um, there are other mitigations. Yes. For instance, fusion. Yep. Fusion basically employs the same behavior for writing to regular pages and copy and write pages. So you basically only see the higher timing. And that, of course, then doesn't allow you anymore to see a timing difference. Yeah. But there also have been further proposals uh, in the academic community. For instance, to only deduplicate uh, zero pages. Right? Yes. But we does that make sense? Are there so many zero pages? Yeah, in uh, certain workloads, zero pages make up a lot of, of, the, of the content, mm. and yeah. Okay, that means you can still gain efficiency there. Yeah. Um, but maybe you can also do something else. Um, maybe we can detect the attack on a network layer, because you are sending a lot of packets, so we can just detect that, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Or uh, if we would encrypt or encode pages with a random salt or with a key, then also they couldn't be deduplicated anymore, mm -hmm. but that would boil down to the same problem. And we are disabling memory deduplication. Or if the key and the, the salt um, are only specific to the security domain, then they would still allow the same attack. Um, we definitely evaluated uh, some of these mitigations. And one of them is a fusion that we looked at. And here you can see the timing differences when fusion is enabled. Yeah. And what does it look like when we disable fusion? Like this. Then we can still clearly see the kernel offset in our KSLR break. Yes. OK. So we see there are mitigations to this attack um, that don't sacrifice uh, the um, entire efficiency of the system. And uh, maybe that's also already the point where we um, get to the conclusion. Um, some, uh, just maybe also here to mention, um, the remote attack got a new CVE that was in 2021, 20, uh, and um, we were able to mount uh, multiple different attacks. The first one was a remote fingerprinting of libraries or executables on the system. The second one and the second one was the KSL outbreak we saw mm -hmm. uh, that managed to uh, work in under four minutes, so that's very nice. Over the internet, mm. it's to em emphasize, I, I think. Yeah, I always and hear this argument, yeah, KSLR is broken anyway. 
if you already have code execution on the system. But if you don't have code execution on the system, then still a KSR break is uh, quite valuable. So, um, or can be, depending on what your attack vector is. So, the um, third attack then was the leakage of the database records, byte by byte, uh, exploiting this reorganization in InnoDB. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we have been working with Red Hat there, um, and they have developed a probabilistic uh, mitigation um, as opt-in for the Linux kernel. That's not main, main, um, in the mainline kernel yet. Um, it's just a uh, request for uh, comments yeah. so far. Okay, and with that, we are at the end of our talk, and uh, we would be happy to take your questions. Thank you.